It's time again for another edition of the world famous Driving You Crazy podcast. This is the show where we talk about all things transportation and we love every single minute of it. Yes, we do. I am the co host of this show, the traffic anchor for Denver 7 News. My name is Jason Luber. I'm Denver 7's own pedestrian advocate and alternative transportation advocate, Joseph Peters, wishing a happy belated birthday to Henry the Fonz Fonzarelli. Are you talking about the character of the Fonz, or you're talking about the Winkler the, guy? The Winkler. Yep. Henry. 73 Winkler. years young. Is he really? Yeah. Interesting. Yep. And I see you've expanded your title. You're not just pedestrian advocate. You're also alternative transportation advocate. That's correct. Okay. I've come around on the scooters. I've come around on the bicycles. I think now it's time for us to figure out a way to share the road. Well, we did have Thomas Hoppo do a whole story about how the bikers and the scooters are not getting along together. I was um, ready to punch a scooter rider today for riding a scooter too fast on the sidewalk. He took a corner wheel sharp and almost ran right into me. And then what would you have done if he did? I, I probably would have knocked him over. Let's be honest here. And then, would fisticuffs be next? I think once you get knocked off a scooter by a pedestrian, you've already been embarrassed enough. <laughs> right? You think so? I think so. That would be a good way, though, to do trick-or-treating, though. I was thinking about if you got on the scooter and you could go from building to building to building or house to house to house, bang, you're, uh, you're really getting collecting a lot of well, treats. Don't give people ideas, man. You know that's going to happen now that you brought it up. Coming up in just a bit, we're going to talk to Dr. Alejandro uh, Anau uh, in just a bit. Well, uh, Alejandro, he wrote a doctoral thesis about uh, ride-sharing and how it contributes to traffic congestion in his opinion there and to gather the data he he said he he at least in the in the stuff i was been reading that he's been having he had a hard time getting information from uber and lyft so he went to go get the data himself and he became a driver for uber and lyft um so i'll ask him the question if they knew about it if if they would help share any data with him we'll we'll ask him that uh, as part of the conversation but that conversation is coming up in just a bit but first, we need to start with one of the housekeeping items from last week. Uh, I think it was you who asked me about uh, Wild E. Coyote, super genius. I did. I did And ask. whether if he ever caught the Roadrunner. Well, I did some research, because that's what I'm good at doing. Research. Watching cartoons. Yes. And I found two different episodes. One was where the Coyote was chasing the Roadrunner. He was going through a series of ever smaller pipes. And when they both exited, they were really small. Like uh, soda can size small, right? So they look at the camera and they stop and they go run back through the pipes. And while the Roadrunner returned to the normal size after they got through the ever increasing size pipes, the the uh, Coyote was still super small. And so he 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 goes, oh look, this is my perfect chance to catch the Roadrunner. He turned around and then he runs into the Roadrunner's gigantic legs. He he first jumps over his feet, comes back, gives the Roadrunner uh, legs a big hug, like he's I finally caught this guy. And then, and then he smiles, he puts on a bib, pulls out a knife and fork from his, well, pretend pockets <laughs> from his <laughs> When side. you're a cartoon character, you got pockets everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and, and then he looks up, and when he looks up, he, he, he looks up about 1,000 feet, and he sees the huge, gigantic roadrunner. And, and then, of course, then he drops his knife and fork, and then he holds up a sign that says, Okay, wise guys, you always wanted me to catch him. Now what do I do? So he did catch him. Well, I guess kind of. He did catch him. Okay. In a way, he caught him. What was the other episode? Well, in the other episode, uh, the coyote traps the roadrunner under one of those big serving lids. You know, those big sterling silver. Sil you would see yep. it at like a yep. hotel, right? Those huge lids. And then he throws a bomb under there, and he blows him up. <laughs> and then you see the next scene where the roadrunner is carrying a brown roadrunner like you would see if he was a turkey for Thanksgiving. Uh, over to a table ready to be carved. Uh, then you see these two little boys sitting in front of a 1950s scene. Like they're, they're sitting in front of a 1950s TV on the ground looking up at the coyote about to eat the Roadrunner. And, and the stunned look on their face. <laughs> priceless. They were quite disturbed that it was happening. So, so that is the episode. It happens. So I guess there are two episodes, if you want to say there are two episodes, that the coyote got the Roadrunner. So, congratulations, Coyote. Congratulations, Coyote. And he, you know, I guess that is somewhat transportation related. Running around the desert. Right. Pipes, all that stuff. Uh, I have to tell you about Jess Downing. Okay. Jess was riding her red 2011 Kawasaki motorcycle. 
And she was on the way to her masonry job in Chester, New Hampshire. Have you been to Chester, New Hampshire? I have not been to Chester, New Hampshire. Well, she was going there one morning when a turkey perched on a stone wall in a field decided to take flight. Jess had no time to react when the big bird took off and flew right into her and knocked her off the bike. She said, I saw the whole thing and she saw it leap and just fly at her. And then she went down. She said it hurt. She was skidding on the roadway and then rolled over. She said she was laying there trying to catch her breath for a little bit. And Jess unfortunately broke her right hand. She got some scrapes on her right leg. But I can't say the bird was as fortunate. The bird, well, ended its life. Oh. Mm. It was killed by the impact. So guess what? This is where the story is perfect. Just got to keep the turkey. <laughs> Only in New Hampshire. <laughs> she got to keep the turkey that flew into her and that was killed on the impact. She plans to dismember the bird and keep just parts for her own sick pleasure. <laughs> really? She said she has That's what the, she said? She said she has the tail and the wing and plans to make a turkey tail mount as a souvenir. Why doesn't she just make it for Thanksgiving? This is too easy. I don't know. Cook the bird. Well, Thanksgiving's another, what, I don't know, four weeks away. That's what freezers are for. All right, you have to hear this story out of Australia. It's quite amazing. So the setup here is that there's a man who lost his driver's license, but he still wanted to go out fishing. It's a problem that people have. They do, they do stump, dumb things, get too many tickets, a DUI, whatever the case may be. They lose their driver's license. Now, a lot of those people, they just continue to drive, which they probably shouldn't do. But this guy was heeding. Hold on. Correct. They shouldn't do it because they their license it. was suspended. Right, but they still <laughs> do it anyway. Right? They still do it anyway. But this guy was actually heeding the law okay. and not driving with his suspended driver's license. But he still wanted to go out fishing with his boat. And he used to use his truck to take the boat over to the water. Well, he wasn't able to do that because he's not allowed to drive the truck anymore. So he had to figure out another way to get his boat to the water. So he thought, hmm, I can't drive my truck, but I sure can drive my mobility scooter. The ones that older people usually use to get around the mall or other places. I know what you know, a mobility scooter You know those like. mobility scooters, <laughs> right? Okay. Well, anyway. <laughs> he rigged up a boat to his mobility scooter. Yeah, just take, just take a listen at this. No license, no problem. Shane Swanscott needed to go fishing. Solution? He hooked up his tinny to a mobility scooter. Well, I lost my license, and pretty much at the same time I'd finished fixing up my boat. I was going to push it down by hand, but I thought, why not use this? Look carefully. That's a police car going past. I'm sitting at the lights like this at the turning lane, ready to turn, and the high patrol slows down, like comes past, and just goes like, what the f***? <laughs> The scooter cost just $400. Jumping on, babe. <laughs> a runabout for Shane and partner Kira until he gets his license back. This is a max speed. But you get about 10 k's out of a tank. His makeshift tow bar is broken. Yeah, I'm not real good with a welder. His boat is going nowhere. 4.3 metre stays off a 72 stroke horsepower. Absolutely flies. And the police are deciding what to charge him with. I do not know. I'll find out Sunday. At least he's big on the internet. And Kira is sticking by him. So this is a true love story. <laughs> Mark Burrows, Nine News. That's Nine News Australia. Uh, there were a lot of those words that I, I have no idea what he was talking about because he was speaking Australian. Tinny. What's a tinny? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite sure. But I know look. a lorry is a truck in England, but I don't know. Uh, maybe a tinny is a... I don't know. I think it's a boat. I got a lot of respect for this guy. I'm not going to lie. I got a little, lot less respect for the police. That just drives by him towing a boat with a mobility scooter on right. the roadway like, and don't you, say, don't do anything? Do you have to have a license for a mobility scooter? Should you? Should you be allowed to drive if you've already gotten two DUIs? Can you just hop on your mobility scooter all wasted and do what you want there? I didn't think you could actually ride those things on the real streets. I thought you could only keep them on the sidewalks. I think when you're towing a boat, you don't have a choice. <laughs> no. Well, you know... Necessity is the mother invention, That's of course, truth. right? So you got to give them props for that. However, I, I don't, I don't see how any of that is okay, like legal wise, on the roadways. Driving a mobility scooter at ten kilometers an hour, as he said, um, I think it was ten kilometers. He said it was going, towing the boat. I didn't even realize that a mobility scooter would have enough torque and power to tow a boat. Oh, it usually goes thirty k. 
<laughs> he was towing a boat, so it slowed him down a little bit. I mean, the boat, it, it wasn't, when I saw a picture of the boat, it wasn't like it's a yacht or anything. It wasn't just a little uh, dinghy. I mean, it was a pretty decent-sized boat, like a bass boat kind of a thing. But still, you're looking at the, 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 the weight of the trailer, the weight of the boat. And how do you get that thing? You know, if you're going into a uh, boat slip and you're, and you're running that thing into the water, my, my father used to do this with the – we had a Cadillac with a trailer hitch on the back of it, of course, and we're loading the boat into the <laughs> – I know. There's a lot of stories here. Okay. All right, so we're going we're, – and he would always drop this. It, I, I don't know uh, – you can see this is, is, has really damaged me psychologically. Yep. So we're going backwards, and I'm in the back of the car with my brothers, and it freaked me out so much because he would go so far into the water on that boat slip, and I never thought the car was going to come back out. I mean, uh, far enough where the exhaust pipe is under the water, where the whole almost water is coming into the trunk, it is that deep. Mm. Uh, and then you'll uh, get the boat, it's floating, and, and you get the boat off of the trailer, and then he pulls the trailer uh, and the car out of the water. Uh, but I don't know how you do that with a mobility scooter. That's 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 where I was. That, now I'm having these horrible flashbacks to my childhood, um, which are really quite disturbing. I'll I tell you this: uh, he shouldn't get a ticket. Let him go this time. Don't do it again. So the warning: slap on the wrist. You should just get a slap on the wrist warning. Right, because cops couldn't even dream this one up. <laughs> no, right? There's no law in the books for this. So slap him on the wrist and say, "Don't do it again." If he does it again, throw him in jail for three years. They probably thought it was pretty funny. I think it's pretty. Or uh, maybe the cop was uh, onto a real crime, and that's why he didn't stop to this uh, mess is with a, this guy. This is a real crime. This- <laughs> if you get stuck behind the mobility scooter towing a boat on your ride into work, I guarantee you that's a real crime. I don't know why. If it's, he had a girlfriend, it looked like. It's just he had, why didn't he let her drive the truck? Right? It's <laughs> a fair question. I mean, maybe she wasn't. I don't know if she wasn't old enough to drive the truck, or maybe she also had her license suspended. There's, a, there's some unanswered questions there. Right. Why does he have a mobility scooter? <laughs> that too. He just all of a sudden has a mobility scooter handy. Sounds like a young man, to be honest with you. All right, I saw this a little while back, but I kept forgetting to bring it up. Prosecutors in Los Angeles celebrated an odd milestone as they handed out their first prosecution of a man who was cited for DUI while riding on an electric scooter. Good. He was intoxicated, and he knocked over a pedestrian on a sidewalk. The city's attorney's office there in Los Angeles said that the 28-year-old man from L.A. had a blood alcohol level of more than three times the legal limit to drive a car. So he was quite drunk. He wasn't just a little drunk. He was really hammered. He was on one of those bird electric scooters. He was riding on the sidewalk when he knocked down a 64-year-old man. The man was knocked down, and he cut his knee. Ow. Now, now, oh, all right, don't start with that. Now, the drunk scooter rider didn't stop to help. Instead, he continued down the street to a nearby apartment building and uh, then was later arrested by the police. Now, the drunk scooter man was ordered to pay a fine of $550 and also restitution, which is probably the, includes a deductible for health care, I would think. Mm-hmm. I mean, unless it, maybe he ripped his pants. <laughs> Do you restitute that? I don't. I yeah, don't know why if that's not? How hey, that works. if you knock me down and not my pants rip, you're going to be getting a bill for my pant repair. Okay, that's fair. Okay, that's fair. He was also placed under 36 months of probation and ordered to complete a DUI program. Well, yeah, he was really hammered, really, really drunk. Uh, uh, oh, and he's also not supposed to be using any scooters anymore while drinking. Now they didn't say they couldn't use any more of the scooters ever, just not while he was drinking. I have not been outside at 1 in the morning or 2 in the morning since the scooters came to Denver. I've only heard stories of people saying, oh, let's go get four scooters after we've been at the bar for a couple hours and try racing them up and down the street. Which is to say, I know that this is happening. Oh, of course it's happening. We're just not hearing about it yet. But it's definitely happening. And you got to wonder how many of the accidents that we have heard, or maybe even the scooter v. bike incidents that we've heard about, could be happening late at night or, or maybe at any time of the day when folks are riding these scooters a bit hammered. I have, or even an inebriate. I mean, even if you're just buzzed, you're still going to be driving the scooter weird. It's true. I mean, well, it takes some balance. Let's be honest. It's Colorado. They're all stoned anyway, so who knows? Exactly. That, too. 
I mean, you're going to have a lot of the kids that are out there. They're eating their edibles. They're eating their gummy bears or co- cookies or what, what? I don't know. What do they do? Uh, they're using a lot of hands, let's put it that way, while they're on the scooter trying to stuff all these edibles in their mouth. See, I don't know these things. I'm, <laughs> I'm completely out of that culture. I'm not around the culture. I don't get it. I don't, I'm, I'm not in the, the deal, so I, I, don't, I, I just don't really understand the whole lingo there. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. I have a rude awakening for you. In oh, a few really? years, your daughters will be bringing that into your house. No, they so. won't. Not my sweet babies. <laughs> my sweet babies, are they're in the baton twirling, and Jaylin is now in the band playing the French horn. Oh, perfect. Uh, Jolene is doing her little piano, and she's also in the baton twirling. I mean, they're only 10 and 7 right now, so I, I don't think I have to worry about them just yet. Well, even if you do, you have time. A and, lot of time. And I don't, you know what? I don't. I don't. I really don't think my girls are going to be those kind of girls. But you never know. Well, it's a direct reflection of you. Never forget it. That is true, and I actually tell them all the time: be careful about whose car you get in too, because you are going to be associated not only with those people but with their behavior. Yep. So just be careful about who you're hanging out with because that, that, that guilt by association is a real thing. And to bring it full circle, if you're hanging out with people who get drunk and ride scooters, just stop. Just stop. You don't need that in your life. You don't need to be drunk scootering? Oh, you, if you're doing it, fine. But you don't need to be associating with people who do it if you don't do it. No. On a whole different topic, Joseph, we've talked many, many times on the show here about ride sharing. And we've had the debate also many times about the theory that all the ride sharing cars out there are either reducing congestion on our roads or they're adding to it. There was someone who wanted to do some hands-on research concerning this debate and it actually led him to work for both Uber and Lyft and also receive a doctorate for his research. Yeah, this guy's pretty smart. Mm -hmm. Um, To talk about his findings and his experiences, Dr. Alejandro Enau who now is working with the National Renewable Energy Lab here in Colorado. Doctor, thank you for joining us here on the Driving You Crazy podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Why did you decide to do this research? Uh, part of the reason, so I'm, I'm from Colombia in South America, and I, I've lived in the United States for about uh, 20 years almost now, 18 years. And the thing about moving around and being the Dependent on the car, uh, I grew up, you know, using all different modes of transportation, and including taxis in Colombia. So taxis are uh, well known for creating, in some places, congestion. So Uber and Lyft, in in that way, kind of um, make me remember those experiences back home, back in Colombia, and now seeing it in in Denver. That's where I was like. This needs to be studied from an engineering, transportation engineering standpoint, and that's where the discussion started with my faculty advisors on, on how to do this research. So how was it, let's start with the experience of you being a driver. Did you, did you like it or did you loathe it? Uh, I, I did like the experience. Um, I mean, I don't love to drive. Uh, I have, or actually I just sold my car, uh, but the the reason to do it is is to really embed myself into the system, get to talk to the passengers, not know how it really works. Um, so at the end, I, I end up loving it, and I wouldn't have learned what I learned if, if I didn't do it this way. Um, you know, connecting with the passengers, understanding why people are using it, when and where and why. Um, that sort of, of things that we as researchers look for, having that conversation with the passengers, but also having the hard data. So knowing exactly the GPS locations, the times, the distances, the time, it's very critical for, for us to do uh, both quantitative, quantitative and qualitative research. How many hours a week were you working? Was it day, night? Um, how, how did that go for you? Yeah, so uh, the idea was to try to cover all 24 hours and all seven days a week. So through the period of, of driving all the time, those times were covered. But also trying to replicate, uh, like, when are the rides coming? So starting early, uh, I usually drive, you know, for people going to the airport in the morning or people going to work uh, and then kind of slow down through the middle of the day and it goes pick up again 
once people are off from work and then of course at night because it's a, a social social trips are, are a big thing with Uber and Lyft. Now can you kind of go into anecdotally what you noticed is is the volume of rides primarily around those working commute hours or is it more of the social trips? I think there's a stigma amongst my generation that Lyft is mostly a social thing, but I think what you're describing is that, is that people are using it with a lot of day-to-day functionality. Yeah, well, and, and, and both things are right. So the, the highest peak is, is social trips, and, and you're right that most of the rides are uh, for, for social events or picking up after, you know, people being down at the club or the bar. But, um, but it also provides transportation for people going to work, going to school. Like, I end up a lot of times in Boulder. Uh, like, if I was taking somebody from the airport to going to Boulder, and I, I end up in Boulder all day because a lot of the students use Uber and Lyft, or um, even... Uh, people low-income neighborhoods that don't have much access to transit or transit is not as good or they don't have a car. So it provides mobility across um, all populations and all the, for, for all different purposes. So um, so you, you are right in a sense that it's mostly for social, for social trips, but it also um, it happens for, for other reasons. And following up on that, I was looking at uh, some of the slides on your dissertation defense and that you have a chart that actually lists on the origin of the ride on one side. Uh, and then that's, uh, I think, uh, up and down on the left side. And then uh, uh, then on the right side uh, or going across on the top, you also have the destination. Now, on that chart, I saw that it said home to home. So somebody was going from home to home. You actually listed two rides going from home to to home i just didn't know how that happened <laughs> so that yeah no that's that's a good point so there were a few people that either have two houses so if, if they live in boulder and, and they of have course they do why wouldn't oh, they oh. <laughs> 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 or or it, it could happen you know in surveys where if you were at your girlfriend's house and and then you, you just decide to say i'm going from this home to the other home so it, it, it happens in the data and you know, or picking up the early Saturday morning or Sunday morning pickups that is a little more, um, you, you don't want to question the passenger in that way, just let them answer what they want to answer. So sure. that's, that's what you want to capture as a, as a researcher. Don't go into too much detail. And looking at the driving times and distance summary there, uh, it shows that you did an awful lot of waiting. So even though your time was not used the most efficiently, don't you think, though, that the time for the passengers were used efficiently by having you there waiting for them when they were ready to go rather than have them wait for a bus or maybe the longer travel time it would take for them to walk or take a, take a bike? That's an excellent question. Actually, I'm at a workshop right now in, in Davies, and we're, we're looking at travel behavior, Exchange, uh, changes and, and time the, the the travel time is is a is a very uh, exciting area to do research. Um, so for for what I try to to look at is the experiences for the passenger. So trying to lower the the timing for somebody waiting, uh, but also you have to think about the driver. So. Because of the drivers are pretty independent and they don't have too much data or, or where do they need to go or where do they have to wait. Um, I mean, the really smart drivers know where to go, when to go, and so on. Um, so, that, so that's where we're trying to balance is the waiting time for passengers and then where to locate the drivers where the minimal driving around happens because that's where we worry about is the congestion that can be generating by the drivers if they go around like crazy. So because of the research design that, that we did, um, I was trying to avoid you know going around too much without. So I kind of position myself in places where, as you say, the, the probability of somebody getting the ride or getting the, the waiting time slower. Um, so so it's, it's a very interesting research. Or, or to tell you, for example, the airport is a good example where the drivers, give a ride to the airport in the morning or midday 
And a lot, like I will say, is split in half where some of them used to stay at the airport. There is an actual lot now for TNC drivers for waiting for another uh, passenger to arrive and take a longer trip. But the other half actually end up going all the way back to downtown um, because they don't want to wait. Now, that has implications both for congestion and also the drivers, by going around like the 20 or 30 minutes on the road, um, they are creating, um, they are actually spending, wasting money because there is the maintenance and the fuel use of you going the car. So that has implications for energy use as well, which is what we care about at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the Department of Energy. We're talking with Dr. Alejandro Anal about his thesis on ride sharing and his experience as a ride share uh, driver to get his uh, doctoral uh, or his doctorate. Uh, I, I, I also thought what was interesting uh, was your breakdown of the true realized hourly rate of the average Uber Lyft driver. You list a driver working over 15 hours a week making less than $8 an hour mm. after all their vehicle costs. I mean, we can debate whether or not the cars add to congestion or not, or, or not but, uh, but you can't deny that the drivers really are bringing home less than if they were working in fast food. Yeah, and that's, that's a very um, issue that, that uh, has come up more for, from other researchers. Um, there were some um, early on papers from MIT that, that actually calculated that it was even lower um, than, than what I calculated. But then Uber debated that it's higher, but then they're also showing that in, in cities like Chicago and New York, uh, which um, it might be 11 or, or $12, but the cost of living in those cities are even higher. So we, we need to really think about comparing city to city. So it is without a question. And, and there, there are drivers that, that make, that's in average what I will say they make. And some of them, um, you know, is it, a curve, um, a bell curve. In, in, so the medium is about $8.00. Uh, and then, but then you have some that are even making five dollars an hour, and there, there are some that are making maybe twelve, fifteen dollars an hour. So it depends on when and where you're driving, what kind of vehicle you're using, how how efficient in, in fuel is your vehicle, and so on. But that is a, an issue that you know the companies even know it because the the drivers, after they realize six months into it that they are not making enough money, then they quit or they have to recruit new new drivers. So uh, I think that's that's a, that's a that's something that, that companies are aware of and they have been focusing on the passengers. So they're lowering the, the waiting times and, and uh, trying to get more in the market. But now uh, there has been more recent attention to the drivers um, mm -hmm. because otherwise you're not gonna have the amount of vehicles that you need to support all the market that there is. And there are cities like New York for next year, they actually put a cap similar to in the past with taxis in the number of Uber and Lyft driver or vehicles that are gonna be on the road, except if they can carry uh, a person with disabilities. So if you have a vehicle that, that can be accessible, then that doesn't go into the cap, but um, they are putting a cap on the number of vehicles for two reasons. So they, they claim congestion and then they claim that the drivers are not making enough money, which in a way is, is okay to do, but it's not also it's not the best, probably not the best policy, mm -hmm. which by the way, I, I don't get into policy. We just do research and then somebody else make the policy decision. But I think we need more research to really understand um, so for the policymakers can understand what are the best decisions that they can make. Well, and I, it's nice to see the city of New York step in and try to do something about it. But I, I think my question for you is somebody who drove for the company, and, and maybe you can answer briefly as a driver instead of as a researcher. Shouldn't the company step up to the plate and at least make sure you guys are making an adjusted $10 an hour after expenses? Uh, I completely agree. Um, but as I said, I think like even there was a change of the upper management with Uber, you know, when um, the, the previous CEO was in place and he really didn't believe in the tipping for, for Uber drivers and with the new CEO that was implemented. And 
tip, tipping can make a big difference. It, a, a dollar or two dollar in, in a rye can really put somebody from making minimum wage to make making over minimum wage. So um, I, I do believe, but also at the same time, I don't I don't really have or know the numbers or what is the thought behind uh, the people um, that do research. And, and believe me, they have a bunch of PhDs and and have all the data to to really understand this. But that was that, that was an interesting part of your or of your study is that uh, the drivers, it doesn't seem, and, and you mentioned this just a moment ago, that it, it seems like most of the drivers aren't going to be long-lasting drivers. I was talking to a guy yesterday who stopped by in his personal vehicle, and he was delivering me a package from Amazon, and in his car he had packages stacked in the back seat and the front seat on the dashboard while right in front of his steering wheel. He had packages everywhere. And he says he makes more money with Amazon doing basically the same thing. He says it's nice that the packages don't even talk because uh, <laughs> you could just drive around, not have to worry about yeah. that. But it, it, it's, it seems like these drivers for Uber and Lyft, they're not very long-lasting drivers. They do it for three, six, maybe nine months, and then they realize that it's really not, they're not making the money that they need to make. Yeah, and, and so the, I think that's part of, of why... Um, maybe the thought behind the, the people managing at Uber or Lyft is that they know that maybe it's a, a, it's a short period of time that some drivers do it and then new people will come do it or the college that is, is gives the flexibility to do it during some times of the day or if you're in between jobs or things like that. So it's a, it's a market, a labor market of the population that they can exploit and maybe it's just they look for a temporary thing, but and not a long term. But again, I, I think I think the the longer the drivers are in place, the better because the the longer a driver has been in place, the less circulating around there's going to happen. Um, there's there are uh, no ways to do it. They are more experienced to be driving for safety concerns. So I think there there should be a balance in between. Um, do we just want drivers to be for a few months and then new drivers come into place? Or do we want to protect some of these longer-term drivers and, and do this in a different way? Um, the other thing that I will say is these companies are investing heavily on automated vehicles, which is in the future you might not need a driver. So maybe that's the other piece of the puzzle that, that they're really focusing on that where you will be managing the, your own fleet of vehicles and then you can position those vehicles in certain place. But but we're still a few years from that that scenario. So I think it's very important to to keep protecting the 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 drivers. And there has been cities um, especially in Europe or even in Seattle to try to protect the, the drivers or allow them to unionize or ask for some employment that that usually some of the other ones um, don't have. Another interesting finding is that many of the riders stated on your survey that they took a ride with you because parking was either too expensive or too difficult for them to deal with. I contend that this is a direct result of all the new buildings that we're seeing, especially here in downtown Denver, and they're being put up mostly in places where we used to have surface parking lots. Can you? Yeah, so parking, and I have done some research with parking in the past. Um, parking is one of those things that everybody wants it, and we all want a lot of parking, uh, free parking, and so on, but that has a lot of implications for um for how we design cities. So if you look at an aerial picture of Denver, uh, about half of the land that we have is used for parking. So th there is a balance between how much parking you need. So too minimum is not good, and that's what we always think, but too much is also not good. So airports, let's say, we, we did another report where we look at, okay, people are shifting how you go to the airport. So you might not be going to the airport in your own car and parking them for the three or four days that you're in vacation or for business travel. So um, so because, you know, going to 
to the airport is, is expensive and it's difficult in the sense that you have to go park and it's an additional 15, 20 minutes to get to the terminal. You rather just get into an Uber lift and get drop off adjacent to the terminal. So you're saving time and maybe you're just paying a little more um, or even sometimes less depending on how many days you're staying or how much you're paying for parking. So that's an stated reason in sometimes why I, or if I have a meeting downtown and it's not too expensive uh, or I'm not too far, I would rather just take an Uber or Lyft, pay, I don't know, 10 or $15, than have to worry about finding parking and, and, or paying for parking and so on. So this creates opportunities to maybe rethink about parking and providing the right amount of parking or right pricing parking in, in places where there is high demand. Now, I, I think the basic summary of your thesis is that rideshare and all these rideshare uh, people, drivers that are out there, is actually adding to congestion around these major cities. But where do you think personal preference comes into play? A as you said, people would have taken the bus or walked or biked if they didn't have Uber or Lyft. Obviously, there were enough people out there who wanted something more convenient and that's why someone created these rideshare companies to meet that need. I prefer rideshare over a cab and that over a bus and that over a bike and that over walking. So where, where do you think personal preference comes into play? No, that, that's an excellent question. And again, that's another topic besides, you know, economics, thinking about um, the cause and then the time. Uh, convenience is, is, is a big one, and convenience can mean a lot of very different things, but um, what you are mentioning goes along with what we're talking about, choices, and the quality of choices. So if, um, if you give a person um, the option to own a car and it's not very expensive and you give them a lot of parking, then that's what people are going to do. If you have a new service like Uber or Lyft come into place and, you know, I don't have to deal with parking, then I'm going to choose that. Um, if the infrastructure is not in place for walking or for biking or the bus only comes every hour, then that's, that's where these services are, are becoming more, more and more popular. So, but there's also opportunities for, okay, what do we do with the transit system? What do we do with our bike system? What do we do with our walking? So uh, to give you an example, we saw the rate of people driving or uh, using car rentals at airports dropping after TNC entry. Um, but we even saw that uh, steeper decline after the rail came to the airport going from Union Station. So a lot of people now are choosing to go to the airport in the rail or facilitating a ride from an Uber or Lyft to the rail, rail, rail line station and going to the airport. Now, the other thing that I want to mention is there are opportunities for these companies to actually provide some pooling. So what we call the true ride sharing. So they, they are call themselves ride sharing. In academia, we try to say ride sourcing or ride hailing um, because a lot of the rides are only a single passenger. But there are opportunities for the pooling and the true sharing when we, if we play around with the cause or how much the difference has to be in order for somebody to be willing to go with somebody else. So uh, these companies are really pushing that envelope and trying to connect transit. But again, infrastructure is really important to, to, to allow the convenience and the shifts to happen. Finally, for me, uh, did Uber or Lyft know what you were doing? And what do you think they have said, if anything, about your findings? Uh -huh. uh, so I have had conversations with people and researchers with both Uber and Lyft. Uh, the, the few people that I've met personally have been very uh, supportive of the work, but at the same time, I don't really know uh, what they think of, 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 you know, doing this. That was one of the worries for my faculty advisor that after I start driving, maybe I was going to get kicked out of the system. Um, if, you know, because a lot of times, and right now we're trying to work and see if we can share data and so on, but that's part of the issue that we have as 
researchers is um, we don't have much data about it. So this kind of uh, open an opportunity to say, look, if you're not going to give us the data, there has to be some ways for us as researchers to collect the data. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. So far, we haven't been very successful in these companies uh, sharing data. Um, I don't know what they really think. I usually there every time there is a research out there, um, if it's in a negative finding with Uber and Lyft, they have something else to counter attack the findings, and that hasn't happened to me. So I guess that's a a good thing, or maybe the the research is 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 somewhat clear on what's the situation that is happening in Denver with with the companies. Um, also. We found we have been getting, or with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, we have been getting kind of new data sets or or new things to understand this, and it goes along with the the findings from the from the dissertation. So that's that's a positive there. Alejandro, thank you so much for joining us here on the Driving You Crazy yeah, podcast. You. We really appreciate your insight and uh, all your knowledge, and congratulations on your doctorate. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I thought that was very interesting. Actually, did you notice uh, during that last question, he had a little laugh when I asked him about whether or not he asked Lyft or Uber if uh, they knew what he was doing. There was mm -hmm. just that little bit of a giggle <laughs> before he started answering the question. Right. Don't let the doctoral uh, thesis fool you. This guy's a rebel. Obviously, they didn't know. Um, they probably wouldn't have allowed him to do this with their permission, and I think Alejandro was concerned every single day he was doing this that if he was caught, they would either get all over him or they would boot him from being uh, Uber or Lyft driver, and that would be the end of that, and so it would probably stop uh, all of his research right there. Um, I, I do think, though, that he, well, as we were talking, that, that being a driver for Uber and Lyft can't be a, a long-term job. I was driving into work this morning. And I saw passing the McDonald's, and there's a, a couple of – there's a parking lot right there, and there's a couple of Uber Lyft drivers that just sit there and hang out and wait, and they're not making any money when they're doing that. And that I, that's where I think most of these drivers are losing money is just on the waiting for the one or two or maybe three rides overnight, and they think they can make a couple extra bucks, but, they're, but they can't because they're, they're spending all their time waiting. Well, and really, it's pretty brutal, right? It's like, oh, you know, you, you feel like you're making all this money because they're not taking taxes out. And because when you're driving, it really starts to add up. But think of all the time you spend just sitting there waiting around, not doing anything, listening to the radio, just wasting your day away. Yeah, it can't be a profitable long-term job. No. I, I could see it. Let's say if I was driving home from work and going um, uh, to the south side of town, and maybe I would uh, you flip it on where you could maybe pick up a couple of rides on your way home, and th that would make it more profitable, I could see, working for an hour or two hours, that sort of thing, and picking up a couple of rides, picking up a couple of bucks, but not doing it where that is your basis of making some money for the next five or six or eight hours. Well, and to your point, you got it's just picking your spots, and if you're not yeah. picking your spots, you're going to get picked off. Because he did say he took a lot of rides there to the airport, which mm -hmm. was interesting. Obviously, a lot of uh, late-night rides. That's where most people are going to be using it uh, at late night. Um, going to work in the morning, I yep. suppose, the morning commutes. Uh, probably the afternoon commutes as well. But um, it's interesting. Did I tell already the story where this guy came to the house last, was it last week? Uh, and he was delivering some Amazon packages. So I was, I was in the garage doing something, and, he, and he, this guy in this car pulls up. And there's packages all over his car. I mean, on the dashboard, on the seats, everywhere in this car. And he, and he looks at me. He goes, hey, I got a package for you. O okay. And, he, and, he, and it was from Amazon. And he said he – so I was asking him some questions about it. And he works for Amazon. And he works a couple hours a day. And all he does is takes the packages and he delivers them privately. And he says that he did the Uber Lyft thing but wasn't really making any money that he as much as he wanted. And he says he can actually make more money doing this. And he, <laughs> he gave me the great line. He said, and the packages don't talk to you. Right. Um, Thankfully. Yes. So the <laughs> Give it so, time. Yeah. So I guess if it, it, it's maybe it's uh, the Uber Lyft thing is, is fine if you have some time to kill and you don't mind waiting and that time is just going wasted anyway. You might as well just, I guess, try to make some money. Or if you're going from one place to another and you can't afford the time to take maybe a couple of riders and then grab a couple of bucks. Well, and I think the other thing that, that gets lost in all this is that it's not passive work. 
right? Like you're actively thinking when you're driving. It's not like something where you can really just go on autopilot or even check your phone in the middle of it. I was doing transcription work on the side as well. And that's the same sort of thing where you're very focused the whole time. You can't take your eyes off of it. Otherwise, you're going to lower your rate, right? Where if you're fully focused for an hour, you can make $12 an hour. But if you're like 60% focused, that's going to drop to nine, eight, seven, and stop yeah. being profitable really quickly. And Uber's a lot the same way. As soon as you take your eye off the ball and you're only 60% in the game instead of 100% in the game, you're not going to be making money anymore. Yeah. And so I, it's just interesting. It's it's interesting to see how this is all going to go and uh, how they're going to keep drivers and and maybe they're just going to be on the uh, uh, on the business plan that they just will always have a new set of drivers coming in and leaving and coming in and leaving and that's okay with them. Well, and that's what creates another niche for companies that do bring on drivers that are experienced and does pay them benefits and all those nice things because yeah. people will pay the extra for that step above. I think that's why you're seeing taxis dying off, but limos are doing mostly fine. And you see that they now have a subscription service where you can actually pay and try to get away from the surge pricing, yep. where you can pay this, uh, uh, I guess you're paying a surge by the subscription service, and then you're not having to worry about the surge pricing. Right, that's called the habitually drunk at 2 a.m. model. <laughs> you know, exactly, which, you know, which is a whole nother problem. To I each suppose. their own, man, those anyway, millennials. <laughs> that about wraps up the show for today, so... Until next time, thanks for listening, and I'm Jason Luber, the Traffic Guy. I'm Happy Days Advocate Joseph Peters. Be safe, and as always, happy motoring.